Konnichiwa and welcome to the Leadership Japan series. I'm your host in Tokyo, Dr. Greg Story, president of Dale Carnegie Training Japan, and much more importantly, you are a student of leadership, highly motivated to be the best in your business field. If you enjoy the program, then please subscribe on iTunes and leave us a review. We would love to hear what you think about the series. How would you like your own access to 103 years of the accumulated wisdom of Dale Carnegie Training? Get our free report, Stop Wasting Money on Training, How to Get the Best Results from Your Training Budget, plus our free white papers, guidebooks, reports, training videos, blogs, newsletters, course information, plus much, much more at japan.com. DaleCarnegie.com. Today is episode 102, and this is from a session I did in Nagoya recently for the American Chamber down there on how to speak the many languages of sales to your clients. Okay, let's listen in and hear how the session went. My home for 40 years, uh, from 92 to 96. I was based in Nagoya as the Australian Consul and Trade Commissioner at that time, so uh, it's like coming home for me in many ways. And tonight we're going to help you with your sales. And we're having a bit of discussion before about who's in sales and who's not in sales. But in reality, today we're all in sales, actually. If you want to have anyone persuaded to do something that you think is a good idea, that's basically a sale. But what we're going to cover tonight is something a bit more technical than that. This is actually a little bit more structured than that, which I hope will be, uh, will be helpful for you. So we're going to start with trying to understand what's interesting to the buyer and create some very, very good questions for the buyer, which is a very novel idea in sales for a lot of salespeople who ask no questions but do a lot of talking. We're going to talk about that. And then the buyer expectation gap, if we don't widen that, there's no action. Nothing happens. So we're going to deal with that too. Despite we have online sales and we have a lot more happening with the internet these days, in most sales jobs though involves people. It's still, this is the connection that human connection. So it's sitting across from the buyer and discussing how you could be of benefit to the buyer. So we haven't still lost the human element. And this is part of the key philosophy from Dale Carnegie's side with sales training, is to try and not be wrapped up in what you want, uh, actually start thinking about what the client needs and switch the mentality, switch the whole focus which sounds simple enough, but most salespeople never do that switch. They're stuck around what they want, and the buyer is a tool to produce revenue. So, uh, this is a little bit difficult in this light because the spotlights are blanking it out a little bit, but this is the sales cycle. I'll try and go through this a little bit. We start over here with planning. So, we're looking at before the sale, even before the sales conversation begins. And these days, we're very lucky with the planning because we have so much information available. Uh, you'll find also the person who's meeting you if you're in a sales job will often have Googled you. Uh, they've had a look at your company online. They've actually got a lot more information. In fact, it's an interesting thing with sales. Once upon a time, the salesperson had basically a monopoly on the information. But today, that's gone. The buyer side has got a lot more information as well. But there's still some good planning to be done about that company, uh, where they're going with the future direction, things that are important to them, what is the policy that they've uh, implemented that's going to affect the buying cycle. And then we start with here with rapport. Rapport is the idea of initial trust with a buyer. We are all card carrying skeptics, all of us. We are all doubtful about everything today. So when we get into a conversation with a buyer, the buyer is 
doubtful about what we're saying, skeptical about us, skeptical about the company. They don't know us. So we have to be able to build a trust relationship very, very quickly, very early. After that, we go into interest. Interest here means what is of interest to the client? What do they need? Once we understand what they need, then we have our lineup of solutions. We will match that solution delivery with exactly what they need. And then we have motive. This would be, they may not be convinced of what we said. They may have some doubt. They may have some problems with the solution we've decided is best for them. And they want some clarification, commonly called handling objections. And then finally, we get them to commit, commonly called closing, which is actually to get the order taken. And when I teach sales training, or our company teaches sales training, Japanese companies as well, <coughs> the two areas that tend to be the weakest are interest, understanding the client's needs, and getting commitment, getting them to buy, closing the, the sale in those terms. We cannot do the entire sales cycle in two hours. I'm not going to attempt that. That would be just a bit too ambitious. But I just go through the cycle to give you an idea that there is a progression in sales. It's not a random thing. Tonight we're going to concentrate on interest. But the point about this cycle is that as you deal with the buyer, the buyer doesn't get the handbook on sales. They don't ever get this diagram. So the buyer has many interests. And the buyer will take the conversation everywhere. But when we're in sales, we have to move the buyer through this progression to get to an outcome. The only place we can possibly short circuit is from we present our solution, and there are no issues, they're happy to buy it, we go straight to getting the commitment. But apart from that, if I don't trust you, uh, well, am I going to buy it? No. If, uh, I, as the salesperson, don't understand your needs, so I give you the wrong solution. Is the buyer going to buy? No. If I've got some issues and you can't deal with them, am I going to buy? <coughs> and if I don't actually ask for the order, unless the client wants to do all the work, often there is no sale. So it has a natural flow. It's a very logical flow. I don't think magic about this. Every sales training will have something like this. The point is that it is a progression. You have to go through all parts. But the conversation with the client doesn't follow that logical order. It goes everywhere. The object there is to bring the conversation back to the next stage so we get to a positive outcome for both parties. That's where we go with that. So when we have, and I'll assume we've gone through the initial stage of building the trust and building rapport, which we're not going to cover tonight, we're going to bridge into opening with questions. Now that is, in a Western environment, not a particularly difficult thing to do. In a Japanese environment, it can be a bit challenging. Anyone have any ideas on why you think asking questions of a Japanese buyer would be challenging? Anyone have any ideas on that? They might not know the answer. They may not know the answer, yeah. What else? They won't give you an honest answer. Won't give you an honest answer? What else? How about they don't expect that you, the salesperson, would have the audacity, the nerve, to come in here and ask me questions? You're in sales. Your job? Give me your pitch. My job? Tear it apart. That's the basics of the sales in Japan. So when you turn up as a salesperson and start asking questions, if you haven't set it up, often the Japanese buyer will be upset because you are not corresponding to what they're used to. And they've been trained by generations upon generations of absolutely dreadful salespeople to be given a pitch and then critique it. And you are not following the process. You want to ask them, the buyer, God, the buyer is God, questions. You dare to ask me questions? So, if we don't set it up and we're dealing with Japanese buyers, we're going to have a problem. We need to get their permission to ask questions. If we get their permission to ask questions, it is legitimate and they are happy to ask them. But if we just suddenly get into asking them 
a whole bunch of things about their company, trying to understand their need, they can feel very much, oh, this is intrusive. You, you have not the right to ask me questions. You'll just give me a pitch and I'll tell you what's wrong with it. So, to do that, and we're going to design this in a moment, we talk about some general benefits of our organisation, some specific results we've achieved for other buyers, and then a suggestion that maybe we could do the same for you, and then the transition to, in order for me to understand that, may I ask a few questions? Okay, you hear how that goes? So now, you get to work. Right, you get to work. You've got your company. What are some general benefits of your company? What are some specific results you've gotten for your clients today? The suggestion, this is one suggestion, you know, and I'll go through it in a minute. Maybe we could do the same thing for you, transition. In order for me to understand that, would you mind if I ask you a few questions? Very reasonable. So, for example, in Dale Carnegie's case, general benefits. We are a company who, through our training, get behaviour change on the part of the participants so that they absorb and they use the training to get better outcomes for their organisation. For example, we were dealing with a luxury, very high-end Italian brand here in Japan. We trained their entire sales team. Talking to the president of the company, he told me that as a result, their sales increased by 30% that next year. Maybe we could do the same for you. In order for me to understand that, would you mind if I ask you a few questions? Do you hear how that rolls out? Everyone got that? Okay, now your turn. <coughs> Spend a little moment there. Design for yourself, and you're going to practice with each other your credibility statement. So think about some general benefits of your company. Think about some specific results you've had. Make a suggestion. Now, you notice I didn't say we can definitely do something for you. I said maybe, maybe we could do the same for you. And the reason for that is we're talking about low pressure selling here. Right? We don't know. We don't know enough about you yet to know if we can actually do it, but this is what we do. This is what we've done for other people. Hey, maybe we can do the same for you. I'm not sure. I don't know. Maybe we can't. That's why I'm here to find out. In order for me to find out, would you mind if I asked a few questions? The whole point of this exercise is to bridge into asking questions. It's a means of getting permission. So now we can dig into their, their needs, their company detail, with their full permission, to then decide actually whether we do have a solution that fits them or not. And sometimes we don't. I had a potential client call me the other day. They had a particular need. And I said, look, I'm sorry, we don't do that. Someone else is probably better than that than we are. Can't help you. And if you don't have that ability, then that's where it stops, because you can't deliver it. But at this point, we don't know that yet. But all we need is a permission to ask questions. Who has the first question before you do your design? And then we're going to practice in pairs, by the way. OK? Give it a try. Who has the first question? Anything unclear about that? OK, go. Design your credibility statement, and then we'll practice. Go ahead. Let's just take a little temperature check there and see how we're going. Can someone share their general benefits of their organisation, their service? Can someone share that and give an idea how that's flying? Who's got one? You've all got one. I think going to do this, but... Uh, I'm, on, yep. I'm on the time, same time zone as my clients. And uh, in the U.S., obviously, there's, if they're using someone in the U.S., it's a big issue, I think. So in our, in our patent business, being able to bridge across all time zones is critical because time is money. That is the general benefit. Now, what's the specific benefit? We, what would flow on from there? Uh, contact is easier, mm -hmm. I guess. Uh, we have been able. We have been able to 
support clients at critical points of getting their patents done when the clock is ticking because of that international <coughs> scope. So we're working 24 hours a day to make those timelines. And we had a case, an American company needed to register their patent here and we were able to do that as one of five different countries they were hitting at the same time. They needed to get it across all five. That saved them ultimately a lot of time and money and made it very, very easy for them to be successful in the market. Maybe we could do the same for you. In order for me to understand that, would you mind if I ask a few questions? See how that flows? Who else has got a, a general benefit? Yeah, please. So the company I work for provides translations and editing for publication. Mm -hmm. And we've done work for everybody from the United Nations, the Japanese Space Agency, and most mm -hmm. universities here in Japan. Mm -hmm. As one specific example, at one pharmaceutical company, we were able to increase the number of publications from eight in one year to 35 in the next year. We reduced the average turnaround by one rejection cycle, which can be up to 18 months. And what's the, what's the benefit to that pharmaceutical company to go from 8 to 35? What does that mean for them? Uh, the, the benefit is that you get to market faster, uh, you get uh, response and approval faster. Because the so you get to market, so the whole go to market speed increases dramatically. The speed is increased because there's not so much time spending back and forth with people who didn't understand the language. So? So maybe we can do the same thing for you. Do you mind if I ask a few questions? In order for me to understand that, may I ask a few? You can say that, may I ask a few questions, fine, but it's nice to link. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know if we can help you. I've got no idea. <coughs> maybe. But, you know, to help me clarify whether I can or not, maybe could I, could I ask you a few questions to find that out? Very low key. Very low key sales. No pressure. And when we say, maybe, look at my face. Maybe, we could do that. The face is saying, I don't know. The facial expression matches the words. I'm not saying maybe <laughs> like that, right? I'm, I'm, my face is showing a puzzled expression to be congruent with the words I'm using because I am not sure. So I'm looking like, you know, no pressure. Maybe, maybe we could do the same for you. In order for me to understand that, would you mind? Would you mind if I ask you a few questions? Do you hear how that runs? Right? Got the idea? It's a good example. That? Keep going with it and make sure both sides have a go. Keep going. Okay, how are we doing? Can we get someone to model this for us? I mentioned your pairs there. Did you feel that the person you were partnering with was doing a really good job? Anyone feel that their partner did a great job? Yeah. Look at that. Love it. You did a great job. We actually did. We had yours before. Maybe someone else can. Hi, Dave. Uh, Give us an example. Who had their hand up down here? Where did someone have their hand up over here? Was it you, Sammy? No. Uh, this guy right here. This guy right here? Okay. So are you doing it or is he doing a good job? Uh, he, Jonathan's doing a good job. Okay, well, Jonathan. You're here, Jonathan. We already heard. <laughs> you can run it by us again. Okay, take it from the top. All and right. make it a big voice so everyone can hear. <laughs> All right. So the, I changed my example, actually, because... Uh, I already know what the best benefit for my clients. So the best benefit for my clients, the general benefit is that I can read and understand the Japanese. Okay. So. So when your client, okay, where your client, give it to us. Let's go. So the specific results would be if I. No, can no. Where your client? We're in. We're real now. We're live. Okay. Where the client? We're listening. We're sitting here. We're listening to you, and away we go. Oh, this is challenging. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So. Um, as, as a potential client, I can provide you with uh, a service that most people cannot, and that's the ability to read the Japanese patent. So once the patent is translated, I can go back and check the scope of the, the, what you're claiming in the English and confirm that you're getting all the benefits that you can claim in the U.S. patent. Therefore, increasing the value, potentially increasing the value of what you're going to get. And the specific results, we're trying to refer to a client there. 
So if you can take a client, there, there was a manufacturing company, there was a marketing company or something like that who actually had that result and put the two together. Because you're giving us a, a general benefits and then a general result. Give us a specific <coughs> result. There was a uh, Minneapolis company who needed to get a product launch going in Japan. They needed that patent. Because I could understand Japanese and English, I was able to check that type of thing. So you can just meld it together. So can you give us that part again with the more specific example? The reason I asked for that is, if I'm on the buy side, I'm the client, and I'm hearing more detail, I'm more inclined to believe this is actually true than just something that's at a general level. So you don't have to name the company, but if you can name the company, even better. But for often we can't name the company, but be specific about it. Have you got a company in mind? So a certain semiconductor manufacturer. A very large. Very large. <laughs> Are they a large company? Yeah, yeah. Then in sales, we wouldn't say a certain, we'd say a very large semiconductor manufacturer. Yes, yeah, so um, they had the, the ability. I found uh, a specific part in the patent, in the Japanese patent, that they weren't claiming in the U.S., so I was able to expand the scope of of what they were claiming in the U.S. Mm -hmm. patent. So maybe I could uh, potentially help you expand the scope and therefore increase the value of your patents that you own. Do you think you would be interested? In ah, you know? we're not asking about your interest. Yeah. We aren't asking you to buy it, mm. right? What are we asking? Permission to ask questions. We're asking for permissions to find out if actually we can help you not. So at this point, you, you've got a nice suggestion there. Now give me the transition again for permission to ask questions. Uh, do you think it's okay if we ask you, if I ask you about your current services, service provider? I'm going to ask that with a little bit more confidence. Here we're very uncertain, mm -hmm. but here we're more certain. In order for me to understand that, would you mind if I ask you a few questions? You hear it? Would you mind if I ask you a few questions? Okay, why don't we say, would you mind if I interrogate you <laughs> like a detective for the next hour and find out every secret detail of your company's results and how your company works and get to the real nut of it all? Would you mind if I do it like that? <laughs> why don't we say that? Why don't we just say, would you mind if I ask you a few questions? What do you think? The answer's obvious, right? You actually are probably going to spend a good <laughs> chunk of time digging into how that company works, but as the buyer, you're probably not ready for that yet. So we make it again, the transition, would you mind if I ask a few questions? So you make it easy for them to say, I give you permission to ask me questions. Got the idea? See how that works? So I'm, I'm used to signing NDAs when we do this kind of thing. Is that kind of the tra transition? Is that the <coughs> place they would you mind if I ask you a few questions? And of course, I'd be happy to sign a non-disclosure. Of course, yes, that would be perfect. So if you're doing non-disclosure agreements, you'd say, uh, in order for me to understand, would you mind if I ask you a few questions? And of course, uh, I'd sign the non-disclosure agreement immediately before we start. Then that covers that already. Yeah. <coughs> That's good. Anyway, so what we're looking for here is, to, particularly with Japanese buyers, this transition is very, very critical. Get the permission to ask questions. Any questions on this so far? You've all had a bit of a run at it? How'd it go? Okay. All good? It's, it's, hard, okay. it's, hard, it's clear, but difficult to art yeah. articulate. Well, silence is very <laughs> much a, an exercise in semantics. <laughs> The use of language in sales is absolutely critical. So what we say and how we say it makes all the difference. Yes? Um, just a couple of points on the general benefits and the specific results. I, I would assume that those should be tailored for the, per, for the specific person at the company that you're talking to. Yes. So for example, in John's first example, mm -hmm. when he was talking about being able to add more Claims was it? Yeah, to the that widening the scope. Depending on the person that he's talking to, that might be the yes. end result, or that might be a specific result. Correct? Or uh, generally speaking, the general benefits are what your company does. Okay. 
and how you add value. The specific results would be something that is relative for the interest of that person you're meeting. From whichever division they're from or what part of the business they're in, where you can. Now sometimes you can't, but you try and relate a, an actual company that you've served who's benefited from that. And that Italian luxury company I talked about before is an actual company. We trained everybody, we actually did 10 countries around the world, including Japan. We trained every single person. We did a number of tranches of training. They did get that 30% result because that's what the president told me, so it's real. Now, uh, if I was dealing with someone who's maybe in the IT area, that's probably not a very interesting example. So if I had an IT company and had a similar success, I'd try and use that as much as I can match it to their, their interest area. And then, therefore, it makes it more real. And if you can use the company name, ideal, but often we can't. There's the next question. We're all good? Okay. So we try and generate their interest in listening to us by finding out what our solutions will do to basically fix their problem. Now often people don't think about the problem of a client. They think about their problem, which is I'm not getting enough revenue done this month. My sales director's on my case because I'm behind on the numbers. Geez, my commissions were looking too good this month because I haven't sold enough. <laughs> the focus is on the wrong part. So when we get straight into finding out what the client needs and talking about how we can help them, they start to see a benefit in this conversation. Right, so we've got to be careful about how we get into the question part. And this is all I'm going to do is give up on that one because it's too hard. <laughs> it's too <laughs> now, here we go again, another exercise for you. If you have either a piece of paper or a mental piece of paper, start with what you sell. Okay? Just think about that. Just what is it that you sell? It might be your expertise. It might be your experience, it might be a physical product, it might be a service that you have. But tell us what you sell. So start with that, let's get down what you sell. Go. Okay, that was a fairly simple exercise, so how do we go? Who can give you an example of what you sell? Okay, yeah, please. Project management, language and cultural knowledge. Okay, project management, language, cultural knowledge. Okay, that's what he sells. All right, good. Uh, child care services, uh, educational services, literacy programs, uh, experiences through summer school and events. Okay, what else we got? Yeah. Okay. So we saw expertise, training, and translation and editing. Okay, yeah. Yes? Uh, legal advice about intellectual property. Yep, yeah. okay. Yeah. We sell pain relief. For IT problems. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah. Now we're getting somewhere. Right? Mm. Yeah, please. Uh, global relocation solutions. Okay. So, but what people buy is ex is peace of mind. Mm. Thank you. That's where we're going with this, right? <laughs> now let's look at what people buy. So have a look at what you've written down. That's what you're providing. But take it from the viewpoint of the buyer. Pain relief for IT solutions is what they're actually buying, isn't it? So, give me an example, just to get you in the mood a little bit. Imagine you had a DYI store that you're visiting, and there's a big array of electric drills, all colors and weights and battery packs and cordless, etc. And the salesperson is going through all the spec around this one weighs so many kilograms and this one has got this speed and this one has multi-head changing facility and this one's cordless, this one's the cord and blah 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 blah. Actually, what are we buying? What are we actually buying? The ability to complete. Sorry? Exactly. We're buying a hole. The drill is merely the tool to provide that hole, be it in brick, or be it in concrete, or be it in hardwoods, or be it in steel, or be it in softwoods, whatever it might be, 
We are actually buying the whole. The drill is not what we're buying. The drill is just a means to produce that designated hole of a certain size. So if you are the salesperson, you're talking about the functionality of the drill, you're missing an important question there. What would that question be, do you think? You're the salesperson, they've come in, what's the first thing on this basis that we should be asking them? Where do you want what are you trying to do? Yeah. What are you going to use the drill for? What are you trying to drill into? Oh, I'm drilling into plastic. I'm drilling into steel. I'm drilling into brick. I'm drilling into carpet. I'm drilling into soft wood. Every time you hear one of those responses, how you present that drill solution will differ. Do you see how that goes? But if we just talk about, well, this drill is green and it weighs, you know, X number of grams and it's got, you know, cordless and it's fine. We're missing the point. We're not asking the right question because we're just telling. Okay, we're just telling. We've got to get away from telling and start asking. So the first thing we've got to get our mental mind around here is, well, actually, what are people buying so I can ask the right question? You see? So, now having thought about what you sell, now prepare for me what people are actually buying. Go. Have a look at that. And we'll, we'll, maybe we'll start with an example. Now, you're saying, Ryan, that this doesn't really fit your business. So you gave us the example of project management. Mm -hmm. You can relax. Let's get everyone else working. <laughs> what do you think Ryan's buyers are actually buying through getting the project managed properly. Smooth interaction. Saving money. Well, how do they save money? Predictability. Quickly and efficiently. Yeah, speed and efficiency. Yeah. Predictability. S predictability, reliability, lack of rework. They're also buying confidence <coughs> from you, actually. His, his actual role, if I was buying from him for what they're trying to get, is they're trying to confidently get the, the business on the other side of the pond, basically. A project has a beginning and an end. And that project relates to some outcome in that business which is going to be very important for that organization. Correct? Right? So when you think about the business prospect here, if they didn't have that project, they wouldn't get that outcome. So the project management is a tool to deliver the required outcome. And depending on what the business is and what the project is, that outcome could be money, it could be reliability, it could be efficiency, it could be time, it could be any number of things, which is what they're buying. It could be certainty. You know? So you see how this works? When we start to think about those sorts of things, we don't talk about, hey, we're really good project managers over here. You know? Well, <laughs> we kill it. I, I wanted his <laughs> hand over there. That was great. Well, we start asking questions. And the questions would be things like, what is the most important outcome for your company if this project comes in on time, on budget? ROI. And that's a very good starting point to start understanding where they're going with this requirement. So then when we come to ask further questions and give the solution part, we are right focused on their need. You see how that works? Okay. Who had another one they thought was difficult? Well, just give me some examples. What was the, show me the difference between what you sell and what they buy. Give me some contrast. Can someone do that for me? Yeah. Uh, we, sell, we sell translations, but they buy time. Yes, you sell translations, but they're buying time. Because they're not involved in doing it. It's a very specialized area that you're in. Uh, you've got the efficiency, you've got the, the speed experience. They can never match that. Yeah. So it frees them up to go and concentrate on other parts of their business where they're more specialized and more capable. And the opportunity cost of them doing it is high, so it makes sense to resource it. <coughs> Give me another example. Yeah. Back to mine. Well, we sell relocation solutions, but what they're really buying is their employee at work in Japan as soon as possible mm -hmm. and ready to work when he's there. Yeah. So you sell relocations, what they buy is lack of downtime in the flow of business for that particular uh, person um, in the operation here. Right? So yeah, give me another example. Okay. Yeah, please. Yes. We are selling an operation machine 
and then people buy, uh, people get the quality improvement and then the cost reduction via inducing the headcount. Okay, so you sell automated machines that produces savings through uh, efficiencies and headcount reduction of costs. And quality improvement. And quality improvement, right? So you see how we're flipping this a little bit? Give me another one. Yeah, please. I cried by um, the uh, implication behind the cases, so they don't like to know the what's up. So they, they understand the case, but I, I bet they want to buy my uh, experience yes. and implication behind the case. So in one way, what they're buying, if I understand you correctly, is probably risk reduction. Yes, yes Because you've had the experience of the implications of this particular actions, mm -hmm. and if you don't do it this way, this could possibly go wrong. They don't know all those possibilities. You do. So you reduce their risk substantially. There's a compliance benefit, there's a legal benefit, and there's a cost benefit in being able to do that, isn't there? Yeah, one more. Yeah, please. Okay. We sell recruiting service. Then uh, people buy the developing their business or organization. This is the, on the employer side. Mm -hmm. Right? So you supply staff as a recruiter for companies. What they are buying is actual expertise. Right fit. They want the right people on the right bus and sitting in the right seats. That's what you're supplying. The right people in the right seat so that business takes off. Yeah, great. So do you see now a little bit when we start to think about sales, it's not about us, it's about the client. It's not about what we need, it's about what the client needs. So when we start to switch our mind that oh, I sell training to I don't sell training, I sell output increase through the delivery tool mechanism of training, for example. So these are the interest areas. There's a primary interest, a buying motive, a buying criteria, and some other considerations. So if we think of this, primary interest would be, what do you think? What would be the primary interest that the client has? Solving a specific problem. So you've got children with yes. parents. Yes. The parents would like their children educated in English. The primary interest is I want my children to have a good facility in English. That's their primary interest. Okay? Very straightforward. Right? If you're in the meat business, the primary interest is getting a good quality meat product of some type. Right? That's the primary interest. That's what they want. That's fine. Now, sometimes there might be some buying criteria. What would, what would buying criteria include, do you think? Return price. on investment. Uh, oh, I guess. Price. What else? Yeah. Price. Price. Yeah. Quality. Brand. 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 What else? Warranty. Warranty. Warranty, yeah. What else? Yeah. Weight. Right. Color. Mm -hmm. Spec. <clears throat> right? Budget. All those very typical things that come up when you're purchasing a product. If you're going to buy a car, for example, what's the buying criteria on the car? Two door for two people. Four door for a family. Completely different buying criteria. We need a two door soft top. We need a wagon. Right? That's your buying criteria. So we need to understand what is the thing they're actually trying to achieve here their primary interest, what they're actually wanting to buy, what is it? We also need to know what's the criteria. Is it a bu what's the budget, colors, weight, whatever it might be? What about some what are some other considerations do you think? Defensibility. Defensibility? <laughs> Defensibility, okay, being able to justify the purchase to somebody else, yeah? Right. What else? That's Particularly fine. maybe a superior? Or, or you've you been tasked to go and get something? And then you have to sell it on to your boss as to why we should go with this group. Yeah, what else? Personality. Sorry? Personality of the... Um, Personality in terms of the, um, their interest area? Yes. Maybe they like to deal with people they like. Right? What else? What are some other considerations when you're buying things? 
Word of mouth? Yeah, it could be your reputation. Okay. <clears throat> this comes back to reliability. What about the buying motive? What do you think the buying motive might be? Incentives, like promotions? Sorry? Discounts. Sorry, my voice. That's Incentives, okay. Incentives, like uh, promotions or discounts? <clears throat> that could probably be other considerations in this, this breakdown. So that's a, a point we didn't raise before. But this is the buying motive. This is what's driving the buyer. You're dealing with a human being here, right? Need. They are sitting across the table from you. What is their drive? What is their strong motive in this process? Yeah. So that might be, for example, in IT, it would be someone that I don't want to be woken up at 3 o'clock in the morning because the system has crashed again. So mm -hmm. pain relief or... And who's going to have the most pain if that system crashes at 3 o'clock in the morning? Me. <laughs> In their company. In their company, yeah. Yeah, but that's what I'm saying. They're the buyer. Right. So where's the real pain point for the person you're talking to? Right, so if it's someone in finance, it might be a financial pain. If it's someone who's actually... Now, let's stick with the IT example. Right. They're your client. They don't want the system going down at 3 in the morning. Right. They're on the buy side. What is the pain point for that individual? What's their motive? Their personal, individual motive. What do you think it is? So, for example, if, if my customer, if the person making the buying decision is uh, the head of the IT department, he might actually be the person who gets the phone call, who, who gets woken up to, to go in and mess and with fix up. So what's the drive for that person? To not be dragged out of bed at 3 o'clock in the morning. Is that person being dragged out of bed at 3 in the morning the problem? No. Where does the buck stop here? When you get chewed out by the boss. Exactly. Getting out of bed at 3 o'clock in the morning and fixing it before 6 and your boss doesn't know is one issue. When everyone turns out to work and nothing is working and the whole company comes to a massive grinding halt, whose head are they going after, do you think? The person who is responsible for the purchase. So the buying motive, in that case, might be job preservation. It may not be, I get eight hours sleep. It may be, I don't blow my career up because I just wrecked the whole company because I made an incorrect decision. You see where we're going with this? So we're dealing with people. <coughs> what would be some other buying motives? Think about it. There's also the plus side. What would be some <coughs> plus sides for them? For the buyer, what do you think some plus sides for them? Promotion? Yes. It goes well. Your solution is brilliant. This is genius. This is fantastic. This is really pumping. Production is up. Revenue is up. Motivation is up. Speed is up. Efficiency is up. It's all going gangbusters. They're looking good. They get promoted. What else do they get? How else do we reward people? St status. They get status? Yeah. What's another thing they give them? Bonuses. Bonuses! Cash! <laughs> right? Money! So if you're on the buy side, this can impact your career, it can impact your bonus, it could impact maybe a, a promotion, maybe an increase in salary. It's got a lot of things going for it. Now here's the tricky part. In Japan, how easy it is, do you think, to find out the buying motive of the Japanese person who's the buyer? Damn near impossible. <laughs> yeah, that's right. In Japan, when you ask these types of questions, and the question would be something like, well, Ryan, if things go really well, and this is an outstanding success, what would that mean for your career? That's the sort of question you're going to ask, right? To get right down to what's in it for them. What's a Japanese buyer likely to say? And the Japanese in the room, keep calm. Let these foreigners work it out for themselves. <laughs> if you already know the answer to that, make them do some work. What do you think? It's for the company. It's, not about that. That. it's for the company. The company will be really happy. My team will be really happy. You know, it's 
never about them. Now, if you're doing a Western buy, it's all about you're going to get a big bonus. I'm going to Hawaii on my holiday, you know? Me, me, me. But in Japan, because it's a group culture, it's not me, 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 they will talk about the group. They will talk about the company. They will not say about, well, you know, I can impress my uh, mother-in-law because I'm going to get a promotion, you know, and <laughs> fix that part of the relationship, you know? They, they're not going to go there. But that doesn't matter. Does that, that doesn't matter. Oh, does that mean that the personal motives that they may not reveal are still important? or is it They are, important? but you're never going to know them. But when we get to the solution provision, we wrap the solution up in this will help the team to be very proud that they introduced this new service and got this outstanding result. Everyone will feel much appreciated in the company through their efforts. So you're tying the benefit back to what they've told you. You don't know what their individual motivation is because they won't tell you. But you can still take whatever they tell you and then focus the solution outcome as a benefit <coughs> around that particular thing they've identified to you. So if it's a Western audience, it's much easier. You ask this question with a Western audience, simple. Oh, more money, bigger bonus. I'm going to promote it. Straight away, <laughs> instant. Right. But Japan's a little bit, little bit different. So, do you see where we're going here? We're trying to use questioning skills to come up with some very specific items. Yes, what do they want to buy? They want to buy an IT software that will deliver something or other. That's a very easy thing. This is probably the easiest thing to understand. But we should also ask, what is the buying criteria? Well, you know, it, it has to have such such a facility or a functionality or whatever. It's got to be within this sort of budget. This is a time frame. You know, some other considerations. Well, you know, if you could give us, uh, you know, 60-day payment terms, that would help. You know, might be just another consideration. Might may not be a deal breaker, but you know, that would help us. Or, you know, can you, uh, can you give us some help here on the guarantee? You know, you've only given us a, a one-year guarantee. Could you make that longer? You know, that would be helpful. So, what are some other things? And then, what's in it for me? So, when we're asking questions, this is what we're actually trying to get to through the questions. We're not asking questions for the sake of being interested. This is where we're going with the questions. Do you see that? Okay. Well, actually, let me go back. Any questions on this part? Because we're going to get to practice this in a minute. Any questions so far on this? We all good? All good? Okay. Now, here's a problem. Listening skills. Most people have got poor listening skills. Salespeople, particularly poor. <laughs> particularly poor listening skills. Because they're only interested in listening to their own voice. Because when they get in front of the client, all they want to do is talk. Now, you think, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. Salespeople love to talk. So they come in, and I used to run the uh, retail branches, the retail banking division for the Shinsei Bank. We were selling financial products to high net worth, wealthy Japanese people. They weren't the super wealthy, but they were pretty wealthy. Right? So these are a very elite client group. We're selling financial products to them. So what are our salespeople doing? You turn up, they pull out the brochure for this product. Oh, don't like that one? How about this one? Oh, don't like that one? How about this one? Don't like that one either? How about this one? We'll get one of these soon. And all they're doing is talking product. They're not asking questions. This is what I joined. I turned that around as a sales leader. But this is the problem. They were not asking any questions. What do you need to do with your wealth? What do you want to achieve from your wealth? Is it a protection? Is it a growth? Is it for succession planning in the family? Where is the out game here, or the end game for you, the goal for you? They never ask those questions. I write articles for the American Chamber Journal. I hope you all read them, by the way. It's compulsory reading from now on. <laughs> uh, I either have them as an editorial where it's a piece, as a featured article, or I write editorial. If you read my editorial, there's no propaganda in there. It's a pure article. And it's every issue, it's in there. 
And I was relating in one story, I'm a buyer of services too. I'd been to a function, I'd met the president uh, of this company here in Japan. He was actually uh, somewhere in Scandinavia. Any Scandinavians in the audience here tonight? Oh good, we can talk about them later. <laughs> so, two things amazed me. The first thing that amazed me was, uh, it was pretty innocent what they were talking about. This sounded like, oh, this sounds like we could use this. So I bustle over to the president after his talk and said, hey, that, that sounds really interesting. I'd, maybe you can get one of your salespeople to come around and give me some more detail on that. And it's like one of those really blank expressions, you know, like, it was just, mm -hmm. very little interest, you know, I was like, wow, okay. Maybe the president, she gets some training from Dale Carnegie, looks exactly. a bit more enthusiastic <laughs> yeah. when the buyer comes over to you saying, I'd like to hear more about this, you know. But he's very, very unexpression, very unemotional about it. Well, oh, okay. So finally the sales guy comes, sales guy in this case, sales director, actually, Japanese guy comes, and uh, we're sitting in my office, we start the meeting. He starts the meeting this way. He opens up the oyster shell on the laptop, turns around to show me the screen and then starts pressing buttons and starts taking me through the product. And I'm sitting there. I'm a sales trainer, right? I'm a salesperson myself, right? So I'm sitting there thinking, well, this will be interesting. I wonder how long it's going to take before he asks me a question. I'm sitting there for 40 minutes and there's no questions. And then he finally runs out of stuff to tell me. And so I'm just sitting there. I'm not saying a word. Thinking to myself, this is going to be good. He's now running out of stuff. Where does he go from here? And the guy was sort of a bit flummoxed. Uh, uh, he didn't know what to say. So this is like a couple of months ago. You know? So we do have this problem. The salespeople like to talk. They are not trained well to ask questions. The other thing about questioning is you have to listen very carefully to what the client is telling you but often we are not good. Now, I don't think we ever get to the sort of ignore stage, but that's also possible. The salesperson only wants to tell you what they want to tell you. They're going to ignore what you're saying because they've got things they want to show you. They're going to bludgeon you with the product. They're going to drive over the top of you and somehow hold you down and force you to buy it. Right? So that's pretty rare that they would ignore you. Pretend listening, though. These people are skilled actors. They are geniuses at pretending to be listening to you <laughs> and they're not listening at all because they're thinking about what? What are they thinking about? The next thing to say. say. Sorry? The next thing to say. The next thing to say, exactly. And who's going to say it? The salesperson. They are, right? So they're listening to you going, but he, he is thinking about say like this and he she mentioned that so I can say that and I don't forget about that not actually listening or they're selective listeners what does that mean do you think in terms of a buying conversation what would a salesperson's selective listening mean he said this one word so I gotta go out of this yeah you cling on to that one there's a yes there's a trigger word oh yeah delivery I'll make a big point about that what would be some other selective listening what do you think they're listening for? Asking about something that you that your company does particularly well as opposed to asking about something that your company doesn't do very well. Run that by me again. We like so, <laughs> so for example, in selective listening, the, the customer is talking about needs and they say we really need X and Y. I'm the salesperson, I'm selective sales listening. listening, what am I listening for? Well you hear you hear X and you think, ah, oh, we nail X, but we're the best company in the world with X. I got you, I got you. I got you. Yes, right, that's right. We're we're listening for the things where we're spectacular. And we're ignoring the bits where we actually can't provide a solution. Alright? Yeah, they're listening for oh money, budget, conditions, you know, differentiation, competition. They're listing a whole bunch of specific things about them. Attentive listening is where you are really paying attention. You're not thinking about what you're going to say. You're not having a conversation in your own mind about the next stage of this part of the, the sales interaction. You're actually really paying attention. But proactive listening, what would be the difference, you think, between attentive and proactive? 
talk back? Sorry? <coughs> talk back meaning, am I hearing you right? Did you, and actually Feeding back, clarifying, checking that we're on track, but I'm understanding you correctly, that's one yes. What else do you think? What else would be good for proactive listening? Maybe anticipating <coughs> an issue and raising it, even though they haven't raised it. Okay, that's, you're really thinking about their business. When we get to this level, we're listening with our eyes as well as our ears. We are watching our client very, very carefully as they're explaining the answers to our questions. We're looking for their body language. We're looking for what they're not telling us. We're looking for what hasn't come up that should have come up. Because we've probably been in sales for a while. We've probably had a number of experienced conversations. We know where this needs to go. Why haven't they raised this issue? Why haven't they addressed this? Why haven't they spoken about that? That's at a very high proactive level is the things that are going through our mind as we're listening. And that will then help us to think about what our next question should be. So, uh, listening skills rolls off the tongue very nicely, very easily. But the vast majority of salespeople are not good listeners. So we need to improve in that area. Now, in terms of questioning skills, this is a four-step model with an exciting twist called implications. It's a very simple model. And you can start here with the as-is situation. What is their current situation right now? Or you could start with where they want to be. Where is the should be? It doesn't matter. This particular style, it starts with as-is, but sometimes you can start here. Sometimes a client will start here. Often I have sales conversations with clients and say, well, you know, where we need to be is boom, boom, boom. What we really need around here is bang, bang, bang. And they start right here. Then I'll have to come back and ask them about where they are now to find out the gap. Okay, but basically, we're trying to find out, well, what's your current situation and what you're currently doing and what you've currently got? Understand that. Where do you want to be? What's missing? Uh, what you need to have to get an idea of what's the difference between the two. How big is that gap between the two? Then we need to find out, well, you know what? If you're here and you need to be here, well, why aren't you here now? You know where you need to be. Why aren't you doing it now? What's stopping you? Because what do you think is in there? Why do you think that's important to know? That's what they can't That's what do. you can get sell them. Sorry? Sorry. That, that's what the, your client can't do. Right. And who can do it? We can. We, we can. can. Yeah. So our solution could be right here in the barrier part to help them overcome something they can't do for themselves. You see that? But if we don't ask those sorts of questions, we won't know how we can provide that service for them. And then payout. Payout relates to the personal interest of the person we're speaking with sitting across the table in the buying conversation. What's in it for them? We need to know what, this is the what's in it for you question. If this goes terrific, everyone's outstandingly impressed and happy, and it's all wonderful, what's that mean for you personally? Big bonus! <laughs> right? So we're going to come back to that later when we learn our solution. So there are the questions. Now, let's start. Very simple. Don't make it complicated. Design an as-is question. How would you ask the question to find out what they're currently doing? What's their current situation? Take a moment and design that question. Go ahead. This is not a trick question, by the way. This is a pretty easy question. So give me an example. What would be an as-is question? What's an example? Is, is your child studying English anywhere right now? Yeah. 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 Is your child currently studying English somewhere? Yeah. What's the current situation? Yeah, nice. What else? What's another one? How do you handle international project management right now? Yeah. Yeah. 
How are you, how are you doing your national project management today? Yeah. What steps have you taken to move your employee to Japan? Yeah. Where are you in the relocation process with your employee? Yeah. Very simple, isn't it? This is not complicated. <clears throat> let's ask now the design question, or let's design the question for where would you like things to be? Where do you want things to be? Where, where do you need to be going with this? What's the outcome? What's the outcome look like? Right? Where's the perfect scenario type of idea? Try that. Design that one. Okay. What would be a should be question? Give me an example. Yeah, please. What outcome would you be satisfied with? Yeah. What are you looking for in an What outcome? does a successful outcome look like to you? What would a successful outcome mean for you? Okay, yeah. What's another one? Okay. If writing weren't a barrier, how many papers would your lab publish this year? In a note, that's fine, because you're, you're, you're bridging into barrier, which is good. Or you could just say, what would be an ideal number of papers published this year? What would be a nice, what would be an ideal outcome in publishing papers this year? <coughs> Something like that, very general. What else? One more. Yeah. Can, you, can you ask in a negative way, what, in what ways are you not satisfied? Mm. Very good. Mm. We're trying to get <coughs> starting point, ideal finishing point, and then we're going to try and find how big is the gap. We're going to come to that, yeah. One more. Give me one. But what are the educational goals for your child? Yeah. 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 The end of all this education, what does success look like from your family's point of view for your child's education? Genius. Simple. So what would be some barrier questions? What Think about designing a barrier question. How would we ask what's stopping them from being here? You're here, should be here, but you're not. Something's stopping you. How do we ask that question? Go ahead and design that. Mm. <coughs> How many employees do you have in Japan? Well, remember your barrier question is going to link these two together. Right. For example, <coughs> You've told me that it's very important for the project management to kick off this year because you haven't started yet. And you've said that there are some very specific outcomes that this company needs to achieve. I'd like to know why haven't you started this project earlier? These outcomes are so important. Why, do, why are we doing this today? You hear that? You've got a need. You've told me why it's important. Well, hey, baby, it's that important. Why are we having this conversation? It should be done, right? What's the problem? That's where we're going with this. Give me another barrier question. What's another barrier question we could ask? Are there yeah. certain shortcomings that are preventing your ideal situation from coming to fruition? Yeah. Well, you've just told me what an ideal outcome is. And I'm just wondering to myself, you know, is there some, something internally going on in the company that's not allowing you to deliver that outcome? Or is there something externally that's not allowing you to deliver that outcome that you need? Something like that. Got the idea? Payout, the what's in it for you question. How would we ask that? Take a moment and design that question, and we'll hear a couple of examples. This is pretty easy. All right, so what would be a payout question for that? What's in it for them type of question? Give me an example. Yeah. Basically, what would be, I mean, I'm trying to think of a, a nice way to say it, but really it's... That's very important. What would be... <laughs> that is very, very important. What solution need to you? How much would making this problem go away? Yeah. What would that be worth for you? If this problem was made to go away, what impact would that have on your position in the company? If this problem went away, what impact would that have in a positive way on helping you take your career forward? And do you ask it that way with both a Japanese client and with a foreign client, or do you change that to be how would this help your team, how would this help your company? I'm probably being trained by the Japanese buyers to do that. I would actually ask yes, because I I, I never get that personal answer. But uh, sometimes I will ask it though, 
You never know. You'll, you'll get that rare individual who will actually tell you, but it's pretty rare. But, oh, you know, I would ask. I'd say, well, you know, if this all goes hummingly and it's great, what would that, what would that mean for you personally? You the team would feel good. Okay. Right, we got the idea how that works? So with your partner, go through it. Try it. Go. Okay, let's just put it up there. We'll just take a bit of a check here in a moment. We're going to get to do a bit more practice on this. This is just the first run. Now, remember this word here, implications. Okay, Keep that in your mind because we're going to come back to that. We'll talk about that in a little moment. But the, the questions are to draw it out. What are they trying to buy? What's the spec? What are the things... They need besides that, what's in it for them? That's why I designed the questions. Here's the problem. This is where they are today. That's where they need to be. Something, a barrier is stopping them. There's a gap between the two. This is your solution overcomes that gap problem. Now, what happens though if the gap between where they are today and where they should be is not very large? What does that mean for us as a salesperson? Hard to sell. Why is that? Because they don't see the value mm -hmm. that you're trying to bring to the table. Mm -hmm. They don't see the return on investment, right? Yeah. And there's no urgency. Mm -hmm. They might see the value, but they may not see enough value. Right. Okay, this is often the case. Now, I'm, as I said before, a potential buyer. There's a particular service that I uh, am thinking of buying, and I have not bought it yet. I've just been too busy. But the salesperson has not created a big enough gap in my mind between where I am today and where I should be, and where their solution fits in to help me get there. They have not accentuated overcoming that gap issue. The implication of non-action has been very, very well, it's been zero, actually. <laughs> That's more. So what I'm saying here is, in sales, unless we can help the client understand that taking action now is important, there won't be a sale. That's the bottom line. And that's because we haven't shown that the implication of no action is large. Now, I'll give you an example, a bit of a dramatic example of implication. Imagine we're at the gas stand and the car comes into the gas stand, the guy on the gas stand comes round and he notices that the front left hand tyre pressure is rather low. And he says, dear Mr. Customer or Mrs. Customer, um, I just noticed that the front left hand tyre on your car has got rather low pressure, there's probably a, a leak there. It'll take us 10 minutes to fix it. Uh, shall we go ahead? And the client has a need, but the gap is small, and they say, no, I'm too busy, I'll do it later. So no sale. Okay? There's a need, they should have fixed it, they didn't do it. They didn't buy because the gap was too small. No big deal. Now, same scenario. Car comes in to the driveway, to the gas stand. Gas stand person comes out, notices the front left hand tire, pressure's lower in the tire. Says to the client, Dear Mr. Customer, dear Mrs. Customer, I noticed that the front left hand tire pressure is rather low. You've probably got a slow leak there. Last week, we had a customer come here with exactly the same problem. Unfortunately, that customer was very busy and wasn't able to fix it because it only takes 10 minutes for us to fix it. And they went out on the freeway. And that tire blew! <laughs> and that car turned over three times! And the whole family was killed! It'll take 10 minutes. <laughs> Can we fix your time? Now, what's the difference between scenario one and two? 
the implication. The implication was big, wasn't it? Of non-action. Of non-action. Non we all have an opportunity cost in our businesses of not taking action. When we're asking those questions, we've got to be thinking, how can I bring out the opportunity cost of taking no action to show that this gap is big and it needs to be filled? So when we get to when we get to here in the barrier question, okay, we're asking, well, how are things now? Where would you like it to be? Oh, this is the problem. This point, we start asking things like, well, you've told me that this has been an issue stopping you from addressing this problem you've got. If this goes on as it is now with no resolution, what I'm hearing is that this is going to actually have a negative impact on your potential to hit your targets this year. Is that, as I understand it, correct? So now I'm linking non-action with not hitting their targets in the company because they need this solution. I'm trying to find a way to bring up the cost of taking no action. So in my design, when I'm going through this, I need to phrase the questions in a way that tries to bring out. Now, whenever you get into a sales situation and there's no big gap there and they don't feel any urgency, don't waste your time. Finish that very awful, cheap green tea they've given you and go and find a customer who's got a bigger gap because that sale's going to be almost impossible. That I mean, won't happen this year <laughs> until that gap gets big enough for them to take action. We've got to know which is which. So can, <coughs> if, are there ways to shift that should be? Because uh, for some of our clients, it's just a failure of imagination that, that there should be as a further along. Mm -hmm. Like I had one professor that I talked to and after I talked to him, he gave us a paper that he'd had for 10 years without <laughs> editing it because he just hadn't seen the urgency. Hadn't seen the urgency, yes. Well, exactly right. That's exactly right. When we get to the, the should be, we've got to be digging in there to find out where some implications that we can hone in on to bring up. Now, have you ever had the situation where you've been in a buying mode and the person who's selling to you flags an issue or flags some detail or information that hadn't occurred to you or for which you had not prepared. And you go, oh, that's a good point. We have nothing about that. We haven't thought about that. That's the should be. You highlight things they haven't considered. Which, when they reflect on it, they go, oh, yeah, gee, we better get on to that. I didn't realize those regulations were changing so quickly. I didn't realize that the market was now moving in this direction. You see? So as a salesperson, our skill to bring to them, the buyer, awareness of critical issues is very, very important. But we've got to have that ability to draw out the barriers and the implications behind the barriers to get them to take action. Now, buyers are not all the same. If you're the CEO buyer, what type of things are you interested in? ROI. Yeah. yeah. You're interested in outcomes for the company. If you're the CFO, what are you interested in? Savings. Money. Not spending it. Right? That's what the yeah. CFOs are interested in. Money control, finance control, cash control. <coughs> Executive, big picture, make the strategy work, build the company. Don't blow the company up. Okay? How about the technical buyer? What are they interested in? New toys. Yes, they love toys. They love new toys. They also love doing complex things, often, the technical people, right? They love detail. They like to hear about how this thing works. Often engineers, that type of thing. What about the user buyer? What are they worried about? Ease. Ease of use. Can we install this simply? Will this go smoothly so we don't have any downtime? Will I understand how to do it? 
Is there training that comes with this to explain how this new process works? So each person we're speaking to will be in one of these four boxes. And because of that, the way that we talk to them will vary. We're going to talk money here. We're probably going to talk big picture here. We're probably going to talk spec here. We're probably going to talk ease of use here. They're going to be the things we're going to be providing a solution toward. But because we know they sit in those areas, we're going to ask them specific questions around those areas of interest. Get out of what's in it for them. Because what's in it for this guy, and this guy, and this guy, and this guy, and these gals, or whatever, is different. We need to get that out. That's when we're questioning, we look at who we're talking to and ask certain questions to find that out. Now here's another level of complication. Whoops. That's a bit too complicated. Okay. Well, that slide's not coming up, but uh, let me see if I go to this. No, too far. Another one is personality stock. <coughs> and well, actually, I don't know why that slide's coming up. It's on my sheet here. It's disappeared for some reason. Anyway. Imagine a scale, a horizontal scale. And on this side of the scale, we have low levels of assertion. Okay. On this side of the scale, we have high levels of assertion. What do we mean by assertion, do you think? Willingness to directly state needs and complications. And yeah. Thing. People who are assertive have opinions, and they're happy to tell you their opinion. They're not shy about it. People who are low in assertion terms are not going to tell you their opinion. They're rather restrained. So you have this assertion continuum. On the vertical, we have very high people orientation. On the other end, we have a very high task orientation. Okay? So high people orientation is you like people or you worry about how people will feel. Okay. A high task orientation is you don't care too much about how people feel. You're very interested in outcomes, results, production. The classic task-oriented person, all the people are going to be killed, <laughs> but we're going to take Hill 106. <laughs> right? Task is everything. The people doesn't matter. So when you have this basic diagram here, if you are high in assertion terms and high in people terms, we call that expressive. Often, salespeople. They're assertive because they want to get the sale, but they like people. Okay. Actors, trainers, often expressives. The one who's assertive but task oriented, oriented I should say, CEOs, company owners, the, two, the classic one man shot shop in Japan, right? Time is money! <coughs> show me the money, show me the thing I want to see right now and get out of my office, right? They're very strong drivers. They don't care about the people, make it happen. The opposite end of that is the Amiable, the person who is high people, low assertion. A lot of Japanese fit into that culturally. They're not very loud, they're not very expressive, they're <coughs> considered, they feel how, you know, how the team's thinking about this. If we get the whole team together, we're going to win, get everyone going together, get the group moving together. How will people think about this? They're considering all that. And the bottom well, high task but low assertion are analyticals. Engineers. <laughs> Engineers. <laughs> scientists. Accountants. Medical people. Lawyers. Right? Detail-oriented people. So depending on which one of these pockets our buyer sits in, our way of speaking with them needs to change. If they are a very detail-oriented person, we better come with detail. We better come with facts, evidence, testimonials, three decimal places minimum. Okay, for that type of person. The opposite is the expressive. So, what is you know what is the one thing as a job 
as part of the job that salespeople hate the most? What do you think it is? Rejection. No, no. worse than that. Doing, doing the dying the eyes and crossing the teeth. Paperwork. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> the CRM system. I gotta fill out all this stuff. This is a waste of my time. I should be with the people. This detail stuff's killing me. Right? They don't like it. That's why everyone in the company never gets the salespeople to successfully fill out the CRM. And that's why the marketing department's always having a meltdown. Right? So those sorts of uh, ideas colour how we speak to that person. Don't kill them with detail. Talk big picture. How great it's going to be and how fantastic everyone's going to feel about this. And, you know, we've got a big party after the thing's done. You know? Now the driver type, they are quite happy for you to be direct. Hey boss, there's three things we need to do here. Boom, boom, boom. Which one do you like? I like number two. Now get out of my office and do it. They're happy with that. Don't waste my time. Time is money. Very direct. Tell them straight away. They are not going to be upset. In fact, I'm a driver type. And I remember I had a staff member of mine when I was working uh, in a sales job and she had a project that she wanted to do. And typically with drivers, very fast decision makers. Within like a minute of her telling me what she wanted to do, I, in my mind I said, okay, let's do it. But I'm a driver type and she's not. So I had to sit there for the next 20 minutes and let her tell me the whole thing so I could say yes. Because she would not have felt happy if I just said, oh, that's good, let's do it. She wouldn't have felt she was listened to, maybe thought I was flippant, didn't take it seriously. As a boss, I had to bite my tongue as a driver and sit there and listen to her tell me the whole picture and then say, that sounds fantastic. You've done a great job thinking through this. I really like the way you've presented this. That's fantastic. Let's do it. I support it. I'll put money behind it. So, a driver personality would just say, hey, that's great, let's do it. Next, you know. So we move between, we can move between those types, but we generally have a default type we, we run to. As a leader, I have to move up into expressive. As a trainer, I have to move up into expressive, but I'm really a driver. So we can move around, but generally speaking, when you're dealing with me, you're dealing with a driver. So if you're selling to me, don't waste my time. Because time is money for me and I'm busy. <coughs> Tell me quickly what's going to happen when I make decisions. Let's move on. Is how it works, right? So you know that sort of person. If they're an amiable though, let's have a cup of tea. Let's get to know each other first. Let's take this slow. And the voice would drop. You know, it's a classic. The New Yorker speaking to someone from the Midwest, right? They're yelling at them. <laughs> and they're standing too close too. You know? So it's that sort of idea. The amiable doesn't like you standing too close. And they don't like you yelling either. They like it to be very calm, very harmonious. Let's really think about how everyone's going to feel about this and discuss that. So depending on who you're talking to, you will need to change your communication style. Which is why this session was titled The Four Communication Styles of Sales. Right? We need to switch those gears. And if we do that, then we'll have great success because we all like to deal with people who are like us basically right get on the same wavelength I, I feel in sync with that person right? so we need to change our vocabulary so if you're a very hard driving person you're dealing with somebody who's amiable slow down take out the power if you're not a detail oriented person but you're being analytical start pouring on the detail you see you, you alter what your preferred style is to match their preferred style now you don't become a schizophrenic personality with four different personalities. You have the one personality, but you speak four different sales languages, depending on who you're talking to. That's the key point. So we've got our opening to get permission to ask questions. We go through and ask the questions, trying to find out what their current situation is, where they want to be, what's stopping them, what's the payout for them. We're taking into consideration who they are and what's interesting to them. And then we're also putting an overlay there of the personality style. Now, personality style in many ways is much more important than country of origin or ethnicity. If you're dealing with a person who's an analytical, it doesn't matter whether they're Japanese or Australian or Swedish 
that is not as important as the fact they're an analytical. <coughs> Ethnic roots are interesting, but the fact that they're an analytical will change how you talk to that person. That's much more dominant. There are cultural trends, but that dominance of the personality style is more dominant than the cultural trends. Right. We work our way through with the implications to try and highlight the gap and get some urgency. So who has the first question on what we've covered tonight? I have a question. Yeah. About, uh, listening and um, of the different categories between ignore and to proactive listening. If, if you are engaged in that conversation, you're trying to do your best to be um, actually, what was the set? one below proactive? Attentive. 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 Attentive and proactive somewhere in there. But you do, not trying to be selective, but you do hear things that you want to, to key off of for, mm -hmm. for later. How do you try, I mean, other than maybe just kind of scribbling something down, is there any strategy to try to remember those? Scribbling before? something down. That's the strategy? Okay. That's the strategy. Okay. No one in a sales call is going to say, put down that pen! <laughs> I'm talking! Right? That's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. If they say something, you, you just... You don't even look at it, you just write code, right? X. Just to prompt yourself to make sure you don't miss that point. Because that's the issue. We've all got such pathetic memories. We are terrified that we're going to forget that key item that they told us. And that's why I've got to, I've got to remember that. I've got to remember that. I've got to remember that. Then we tune them out. Forget, yeah. So then you forget all the other 50 million more important clues that they were giving us because we were just tuning into that one clue which was probably a minor clue anyway. So just, just, just have your pen and just go, just keep looking at it and don't even take your eyes off this right. And keep talking. Yeah, here's the next question. Yes, please. With the uh, four different uh, blind perspectives or, or personalities, do you find that in your experience, most people fall to one extreme or that some people might fall somewhere in between both? Uh, the question is, in those four personality styles, are people really boxed into one area or are they sort of moving between the styles? We move between the styles, I think. But when push comes to shove, we have a preference. If you're an analytical, you have a preference. And you like data. So someone who comes and speaks with you who's got lots of good evidence, you feel comfortable about that. I can trust what this guy's saying, what this gal's saying. You just naturally go to that default position. But as an analytical, sometimes you might have to be a bit more assertive in a meeting in the company and be a little bit more toward the driver side of things to get the agreement for the budget. You know, you may not be a driver, but you may need to push a little bit hard on the assertion side. It's like I said before, I'm a driver. I sat there for 20 minutes biting my tongue. Did I want to do that? No. After one minute, I say, that's good, that's good, now get out. You know? Next. You know? But I... I I did that because in that situation, that's what I should have done as the boss, thinking about my staff member and her motivation. But my brain, it's like when I write things, if you ever get an email from me, and Sean, you got emails from me, Yes. what was the first word? Uh, it was a compliment or something. It was yeah. thanks. Yes, thanks. Well, yes. thank you. Yes. Now, it's taken me a long time to train myself to do that because I'm a driver. So I just get straight down to business. You write to me, and I write the answer back straight away. Mm. But I've learned over time to go back and put in the greeting part, you know? Thank you, Sean. <laughs> the people part, right? Because I'm a driver. It gets straight to the point. Time is money. Boom, boom, boom. But that's not how everyone likes to be treated. So when I put in thank you, thanks, then people feel nice. And then I get on to the main game. So I'm a driver type, but I take some steps to sometimes push that down a little bit to consider how people will feel or to build a relationship. Because not everyone wants to be that direct. There's the next question. Yeah. I have a little bit of a scenario. So with Japanese companies, especially the larger ones that are well known, they have a certain attitude about them a lot of times. <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, I'm sure you know that you have a ore sama kind of deal. So, uh, a specific example, I, I've been in meetings where these American companies have come over and I've escorted them to these larger companies 
to help out with the sales and whatnot. And you have, you know, you got five Americans on one side speaking in English, then five Japanese guys on the other side. One guy is looking at the ceiling, two of them are sleeping, and then like maybe the two are actually listening. And they're all very technical engineer, you know, introvert types. How do you get that sense of urgency? How do you drive that point home when you have all these guys, you guys are nodding off, not listening, you know, one guy's looking at you and you don't know if he even understands what they're saying. How do you drive it home at that point? Yeah, there's a nightmare scenario between languages because there's no direct communication here. Are they using an interpreter or is, who's doing the interpreting? You are. Even bigger than she is. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's horrible. It's horrible because the American guys are going, are they listening to me? And I'm going, yeah, they're listening, don't worry. Nobody is listening with their eyes shut, don't worry. It's all right. Oh, yeah, that's <laughs> crazy. They're not sleeping. Yeah. They're really paying attention. In that scenario, it's a tough one. But I think in that case, I don't know what your sales process is like. Is this a show and tell exercise? Have we got a whole bunch of people coming in from the States who are telling a whole bunch of stuff? Or we got some people coming from the States who are asking questions, finding out, getting permission to ask questions, finding out what they need, finding out the gap. You know, I, I'm guessing they're telling, right? Well, there's the first issue. We're going around this the wrong way. So if they came in and they started saying, you know, Look, our company does bloody bloody blah, blah, blah. We've had this success uh, with your company so far. Now there's this new project. Um, this may be uh, another great uh, success too. I don't know. Uh, maybe. I'd like to find out if that's possible by asking a few questions. Would you mind if I asked uh, the panel here some questions? The panel, right? Mm -hmm. So then, you know, you start asking them questions. So now they're engaged. They're not just sitting there getting bored listening to someone rant on about the, the detail. That's probably a particular person's um, responsibility so for tune out. Mm -hmm. So by asking questions, you're starting to engage them. And I think you'll find the whole dynamic will change in that scenario. Right. <coughs> I think we have one, one final question. Yes. Please. Um, thank you for the giving the presentation. I, I, I think it's really good to do the exercises. It's uh, helpful. Um, my question is, do you have uh, any authors, any further reading you would suggest for Japan-specific sales? That's a difficult question, isn't it? Because... Um, or, or courses in... Yeah. Uh, tell, us, tell us about your courses as well. The book, one book that I recommend, which is not um, specific on sales, but it's a great book on how you get on with people, which is a key thing in sales, right? Uh, is how to win friends and influence people. I already read it. You've read it, right? <laughs> read it again. Yes, read it again because, like me, you forget all this stuff. You know, this stuff is all common sense and common knowledge, but we don't practice it. So that's a good book around uh, how to um, be better with people. Another book is called The Sales Advantage, which is a book that we produce. Now, it's not specifically on Japan, but it actually goes through this process, which is handy. Now, as it turns out, I'm actually written a book on selling in Japan. But I'm just too busy to finish the damn thing off and publish it. <laughs> I've actually got it written, I've got, you know, uh, I've just got to get it edited and packaged up and get it out there because it, Japan is a little bit different and uh, it does have some specific things about it. But I, I have to say that I just, you know, it's like one of those things. I will get to it, but I've done it yet. So hold that thought and uh, place an order now. As far as courses go, uh, we do have them. They're mainly in Japanese, of course, because we're in Japan. Uh, we mainly do them in Tokyo. We do courses in, in Nagoya in, the, uh, in Japanese for the Dale Panigi course. But, you know, we can always do, if there's a requirement, we can always put together a class you know, and make a class. We can do that. We have public classes. We have in-house classes. We can do that. That's, you know, we can maybe talk about that later. But that's not impossible. But one of the issues, though, is language, and it's also numbers. <coughs> so thank you very much for your attention tonight. I appreciated your contribution. Uh, I'd just like to thank you on behalf of the entire uh, ACC Chubu chapter. That I think uh, that was one of the best sales presentations, and the best sales presentation I've, I've ever heard. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you. 
Thank you for joining the Leadership Japan series. If you found the program useful, then please subscribe on iTunes and leave us a review. Remember to access your Dale Kenny training free reports, white papers, guidebooks, training videos, blogs, newsletters, course information, plus much, much more. Then go to japan.dalekanigi.com.